We are starting a new series today, and if you've got your Bibles here today, I'd love for you to turn to Matthew 11, uh, verse 25 to 27. This will be the opening scripture, but this is the name of the series, A.B. Father, and you might be wondering what the A.B. is there for. That's the Hebrew name for Father, and the, the letter B is pronounced with a V, so it's Av, and when the Hebrew people saw those letters, it would bring a clear picture, just like it does for us. Us, Each of us have some picture of a dad, or the lack thereof, or positive or negative feelings, or maybe just a a numb feeling when we speak about the Father. And so I wanted to spend this month focusing in on who the Heavenly Father is, and, and what He thinks of us, and our access to Him. And often we can relate to God through just Christian culture, but I want you to let let you know today that you can have a personal relationship with your Heavenly Father. And so this series is all about that. And I just believe that your prayer life's going to grow. I believe that you're going to feel less moments of shame and guilt, but rather live a life of holiness and righteousness because you know your worth in Jesus Christ. And if you know who you, who, who you are in the Father, everything begins to shift. And Jesus reveals this in Matthew 11, verse 25. It says, then Jesus exclaimed. So he's praying. He says to his Father, Father, thank you, for you are Lord, the supreme ruler over heaven and earth. It seems uh, interesting that Jesus is praying that because he says the word Father, but then clarifies amongst the disciples who he's praying to. Because I think the disciples would have understood the word Lord, but to call God Father was kind of a new thing. Uh, Rabbis didn't really call God Father. And so I I think Jesus was doing that on purpose, saying, Father, thank you, and then clarifying, I'm not just speaking to Joseph, my my earthly father. Uh, I'm actually speaking to my heavenly father and clarifies who he's speaking to by the next verse over all things, the supreme ruler over heaven, not just above, but when we see this word heaven and earth, all those things below as well. God is God over all things. And you have hidden the great revelation of your authority from those who are proud and wise in their own eyes. Instead, you have shared it with these who humble themselves. And so God is only seen when we actually say that we don't know it all. And it's not saying that human intellect is bad or human wisdom because that's part of what God made you uh, like. He made you to be a thinker. He made you to be uh, someone that actually ponders things and considers things and develops the brain that he's given you. But Jesus is saying God is so amazing. His love is so incredible. His grace and the, the, the character and the nature of the Father is so wonderful that if you think you can comprehend who the Father is just through your intellect, you're actually going to miss out on how wonderful He is. And, and so often we have a wrong perception of who the Father is. Maybe through our own earthly experiences, our circumstances tend to tell us what God is like. But Jesus elevates our thinking by actually calling us to lower ourselves. As we humble ourselves like, like children and don't think that we know it all, we actually discover who God really is. And so he says in the next verse, Yes, Father, your plan delights your heart as you've chosen this way to extend your kingdom. So it's actually the way that God extends his kingdom is through the revelation. And the revelation is given to those that humble themselves. And the more proud I am, the less I know about God. The more humble I am, the more I'll discover who He is and therefore who I am in Him by giving it to those who have become like trusting children. He's not saying you have to be childish to know God. He's saying having that same level of trust that a child has with their parents, that's what actually helps us to discover who God is. You have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have. No one fully and intimately knows the Son except the Father. So remember, this is Jesus, the Son, talking to the Father. And he's praying, and the disciples are listening. And he says, and no one fully and intimately knows the Father except the Son. But the Son is able to unveil the Father to anyone he chooses. Can you imagine being in this prayer meeting? And this leader steps out and says, I thank you, Lord, that no one knows you like I do. 
See, I think sometimes we just read over scripture and we go, yeah, that makes sense. But for the disciples, they're like, hang on a second. <laughs> I thought we kind of had some kind of connection. Can you, can you imagine the, the awkwardness of Tuesday prayer, prayer meeting, Tuesday morning, which many of you go to here in the city, and you're, and you're crying out to God, and someone just steps up and I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that no one knows you like I do. <laughs> you're like, hang on a second. Who do you think you are? And that's exactly what the disciples would have been thinking. But Jesus was not praying this way to be exclusive. He was praying this way to be helpful. Why? Because we know that the Son, Jesus Christ, is the visible image of an invisible God. That Jesus is saying to us, I want you to know the Father, but if you think you can know the Father apart from Jesus, you'll miss out on who the Father is. So for him to not pray this way would be hurting humanity. It would be hurting the disciples. They would not discover the way, which is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So our access to the Father is through Jesus. Every other way will be like a mirror that is dimly lit. It'll be like a glass window that is, is kind of frosted over. We won't be able to see clearly who the Father is until we actually come to Jesus and humble ourselves and say, Jesus, show me who the Father is. And so we come up with these two questions that I want us to uh, ponder and think about here today, but also through the series, is what do we come to in order to know our worth? All of us are running to something, whether we know it or not. Either we're running to self, we're running to sin, we're running to power, fame. You name it, all the, all the Christian lists that preachers have. You're running to something to find out your worth. You're, you're running to something. I'm running to something every day to find out, am I valuable? Tell me that I'm valuable. That's, that's what each of us have, this insatiable desire to know that we're worth something. Why? Because God placed value on you. God places worth on you, and so this question matters, but the second question actually helps answer the first one, is who do we come to in order to know the Father? See, all of us are discovering our value and our worth. We want to know our value, but in order to find our value, we have father figures. We have parental figures, moms, dads, teachers, leaders, friends, spouses, even our kids, we can look to different relationships in our world, and it's, it's only through the Heavenly Father that we ever actually discover who we are. And so we'll be always running to find our worth if we do not discover who the Father is. That's why this series is so important to me. I pray that you become so healthy as a believer. I, become, I, I really pray that you become such a strong disciple, that you love the Word of God, that you, that you actually want to live out who you are as a child of God. But I want to tell you today, that will not happen unless you get a clearer picture of the Father. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He did not just come to kind of give us a nice religious symbol for Easter. He, he didn't just come so He could wear a cross around our neck. He came to reveal the Father heart of God. That although we are all prodigal sons and daughters, although we are separated because of sin, we do not have a Father that stands afar off, but rather a Father that runs out to us. And Jesus shows us this. And so this is why this series, I believe, this month, we will become healthier. I want to teach you some Hebrew today. And uh, I, I just think that um, these letters are going to change your life. So the Hebrew word for father is A-B. Now we get this from two letters in the Hebrew alph alphabet. The first letter is Aleph, and this is this letter above, and it's a powerful letter. It, 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 the, the symbol of it meant so much to the Israelites, so much to the Hebrew people. And we kinda, we're used to language and, and our, our alphabet, but in fact, we get the word alphabet through the first two letters of the Hebrew, uh, Aleph and Bet. And so out of this language, many languages came. The Greek, Alpha, came out of this letter. So you see the forming of languages out of this Hebrew language. It's very, very powerful. And the reason I want to break this down is that when Jesus began to speak of, in Mark 14, in the garden, and call out Av, or Ava, or Abba, as we see, but the, the letter B is in a V form in the Hebrew language. When he began to cry out and say, Father, the disciples were astonished. Even when he, 
said to them, this is how you pray, our Father who art in heaven. They were shocked. To actually call God something of an intimate word named Father was foreign. Now maybe as believers, maybe you grew up in church and maybe it just feels like, yeah, oh, we, we say it in prayer all the time. We say the Lord's Prayer, but we've maybe missed the impact of what it means. Uh, Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it's, it's powerful because you see this, this symbol here. This means reaching into the heavens, and re- then this one down here means reaching down into earth. This slash here represents the Torah, that it's the Word of God that connects God and man. There's, there's so much meaning just in this image. And we see uh, Bet, this, uh, this kind of uh, roof-like symbol actually means shelter, because that's where we get the, the word house or home or shelter. And so we see that these two letters, when Jesus said them, represented far more than what we might think of. So the way that the Hebrew letters came about where they would draw pictures because their culture was based in agriculture, and so they would find out how to communicate, and they began to draw, and the first letter they drew was the ox, because that was the leading animal, and, and, the, and it represented strength, it represented first, it represented uh, someone that was uh, leading the way. And so the ox, Aleph, is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And so when Jesus says this letter, the, the Hebrew people immediately understood Oh, the Father, or God the Father, is someone that is a strong leader. That is someone that leads the way. He is first above all things. And so I want us to maybe understand today that the Father is not this weak, frail figure. He has not got a long white beard and hobbling along in heaven as this kind of weak father. He's strong. He's like a strong ox leading the way. And so often we look at God as if He is uh, not, not strong enough. Maybe our circumstances have told us that. But the Hebrew people, when Jesus said that, the disciples would have understood that He saw God as strong. Whatever you're facing right now, do you see God as strong? Do you see Him as a leader that could lead you out of that emotion, out of the oppression, out of the depression? See, if we follow His lead as the ox, as the Father God, we will see that he is able to do that. The second letter, bet, means tent or house. And so they drew that letter in the pictorial form as a house. Now this is important because they got this through their experience. And they also uh, revealed the meaning and the power of it through Genesis. So we see that the first letter of all scripture is bet. And so... The word in the beginning in the Hebrew is one word. It's not three words, not in the beginning for Hebrew. It's one condensed word. I won't pronounce it because I will butcher it and heaven will gasp at my pronunciation. But in the beginning starts with bet, but that was on purpose. Why? Because they understood that Aleph, God first above all creation, when he spoke in the beginning... There was Aleph, there was God, the, the leader, the, the one that is over all things, above all creation, that God's desire was actually to make a house for himself. So the earth was actually designed as a dwelling place for God. And so that's why the beginning of Scripture speaks this way, that God's presence would dwell in the earth, that it would be known of, of his amazing love, his creativity, all the animals, the trees, the plants, and ultimately the pinnacle of his creation, you and I, Adam and Eve, he would then dwell with them in this house called the earth. And there would be no separation. There would be no disconnect between the father and his kids, Adam and Eve. He, he would not have any disconnect, and he would shelter them, and he would protect them, and he would be the, the ox that would lead the way. He, he was all these things to Adam. It's interesting that the first letter of most of the names of God in Hebrew start with a left. Adonai, Mighty One, all these names that we see in Scripture start with a left. But it's also interesting that the first letter of humanity, Adam, meaning man, also starts with a left. 
So I want you to see this picture that God made man in his image, Adam, man, so that he could make an earth, a dwelling place, a house, a tent where he could dwell with his kids. Now the enemy comes in, we know the story, wrecks it and thinks he's made it worse. But God was sovereign. God could see before time even began. That's why the scriptures say before the foundation of the world was laid, he'd already promised to give his son. So God could see the suffering. He could see the pain. He could see the tears. He could see what we went through this week in society. He could see the loss. He could see the grieving. But he made a plan that was going to be even greater. And so we see a left bet. He's actually, as you put these together, he's a strong leader. If you want to know a picture of the father, he's strong, but he's also the protector of the household. He's one that provides shelter over your life, that every single person is looking for worth, looking for value, and we find it in the heavenly father. And so the Hebrew letters also made their numbers. So Aleph became one, Bet became two, but out of the, the meanings of these letters and these numbers, we see such depth and insight. Again, I'm, I'm explaining this to help you understand what the disciples thought when Jesus began to call God the Father. Because again, we just say the word Father and we immediately think of the human Father, but I, I need your perception to shift. Because some of you are running away from God when you sin. Some of you are running away from the Father when you don't have it together. But I'm asking you to, to see him as a protector, as someone that's going to lead you into strength, lead you into shelter. Yeah, come on. Give God a hand if you believe it. And so again, all of this is to understand that these letters had great depth, great meaning for the disciples. And to reform and regenerate a new image that God was not just the giver of the law, but he was a loving father to come running to. He was a loving father that, that would embrace you and provide shelter. And so the number one, Aleph, has deep meaning. In fact, we see it throughout man's creation. All computers, your, your iPhone that you love so much and cherish and worship more than Jesus, um, um, that's made out of zeros and ones. It's binary. And so all we see creation is, is, is the same way. It speaks to the oneness of God. That, that everything, you, you might think, well, the number 3,565 is, is, is a separate number. No, it's just many ones. And so we see everything comes back to the oneness of God. He's both three and one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we see it all in this. And the Hebrew people would have understood, wow, the Father, He is the first. He is the one. He is the one that loves us and made all things. And now out of that, He created a house and a dwelling place. And then that's where we see that the Son came out of the Father, Bet. So Jesus became second in that, not second as in less, but He was actually recovering the dwelling place. So we see that Jesus came out of the heavens and put on flesh and dwelt amongst us. Why? Because he wanted his house back. If a thief comes in and your family's in that house, you're not going to look on the outside and go, oh yeah, just take all you want. Come on, anyone awake here across any locations? All right. You're going to be like, what? No, I'm running into that house and I'm protecting my family. So Jesus was not going to stay afar off. He was going to come into the house and put on the flesh and then reclaim the house. He was going to take ownership back and that's exactly what he did. So then we put these two numbers together, one and two. They wouldn't say 12. They would say one plus two equals... Wow, amazing. Such, <laughs> such incredible revelation. The house of the Father has a third resident. So the Father and the Son are reclaiming, but the way they do it is so powerful, so beautiful. The Son gives up His life. And you see the picture of this throughout the Old Testament. 
Abraham, the father, one. Isaac, the son, number two. Jacob, who becomes the nation, Israel. You see these numbers everywhere through Scripture, not to be spooky or mysterious, but to show us this beautiful picture that God is going to reclaim His kids. The Father is coming back. The Father is embracing humanity. He's not going to leave us dying and suffering. He's going to wipe away every tear. He's going to reclaim the house. And not only that, this is the cool thing. The devil thought he won when he tempted Adam and Eve, and caused separation, but the Father knew that a greater level of intimacy was going to happen. How did He do it? He sent His Son to die on a cross and shed His blood and forgive our sins. And watch this. Not only was the earth now the dwelling place, the very kids that He made would be His house. So you are now the house. See, the church is not the house as in this building. You're the house. And it doesn't matter how many ones, 3,000 ones, they're all ones. And as each individual in this place and across locations today and everyone in New York City discovers that God is not afar off, but he wants to make his home in your heart. And your flesh is now the dwelling place of God the Father, and He will protect the house. So no matter what sin tries to do to the house, no matter what the enemy has tried to do to your loved ones, no matter what he's tried to do through cancer, no matter what what he's tried to do through depression, no matter what he's done through oppression, no matter what he's done through anxiety, guess what? Your flesh may be crawling still with temptation, but guess what? The Holy Spirit dwells in this house. And even if I go down to the grave, my Father will raise me back up. Why? Because He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, that would actually redeem all flesh flesh in Jesus' name. So not only does God dwell in this room, but if you say yes to Jesus, he now dwells in your heart. And the enemy cannot touch that. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The enemy thinks he's the prince of this air, but he cannot be the prince of my heart. So begin to shift your perspective. Begin to understand that God loves you so much that now Through the Father and the Son, what we get is the Holy Spirit. So the very Spirit that created all things and the very Son that carried it as the first prototype of humanity that could have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside and make a home in you. Jesus is the evidence that you can also carry the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one. He's the second Adam. He's the one that we should have been like, but because of sin, we aren't like. But now because of Calvary, we can be like in Jesus' name. So now you carry the very Spirit of God that created the sun and the stars and all things. Nothing is impossible for you. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit on the inside. And guess what? The third letter letter of the... Hebrew alphabet is gimel. It means giver. So now you become someone that brings the love of God wherever you go by the Spirit of God. Why? Because He's reclaimed the house. See, this is only a house of God. C3NYC is only a house of God if each individual says, God, make your home in me. Otherwise, we are a social club with Christian karaoke. (laughs) And the world looks on and goes, what? Why do you have words on the screen? What's this all about? Until we begin to discover that God is not afar off, but he's a father that reclaims the house. And he's a God that sends his son to pay the price to reclaim back the house and to actually give his very spirit to live inside of your life so that you would have relationship with him. So I say all this to say this. These are the words after the scripture we just read that Jesus was being so exclusive in his prayer meeting, saying, I'm the only one that knows the Father. He wasn't saying that to say, stay afar off. Look at me. I'm so mighty. I'm so powerful. I'm so wise. He says these words straight after. No one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except the Father. He's saying, I'm about to welcome you into this powerful revelation that of a father, the amazing ox, the one that made the tent, the protector and the shelterer of your life, 
can actually become your reality. He says, come. So he prays an exclusive prayer, and then he says, come. Who are you going to for your worth? Who are you coming to to find out who the Father is? Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened. So it's interesting that he prays this prayer, and he has such intimacy with God, and then he immediately turns to his disciples and those that were following him, and he knows your weariness. He knew their burden. And he says, listen, until you enter into this revelation, until you humble yourself, doesn't matter how smart you are, how wealthy you are, how famous you are, until you enter into the revelation of the Father, you will be weary. Just because you're rich, you cannot pay yourself out of weariness. You cannot marry yourself out of weariness. You cannot... Be famous enough to get out of weariness. Famous people are just as weary as you. They're just as burdened until you come in to relationship and revelation of the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, and have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. You will feel like you are homeless. You will be an orphan for all your days. You will be looking to find someone to father you. You'll be looking to find a mentor, a coach, and all these things are wonderful, but there is no mentor, there is no coach, there is no father, there is no mother that can suffice. I had a great dad, he's still alive, and he's a great dad, he's the most Christ-like man I know, and he's my dad, and I've seen him in and out of good times, and he's so humble, so patient, so loving, and yet I still feel insecure. See, sometimes we think, oh, if I had it like them... I would feel more secure. Man, if my dad owned property, I wouldn't have to deal with this. Man, if my dad taught me about this, then I would have that education. And we think that earthly dads or moms or opportunity will solve the issue. Yes, it might be helpful for here and now, but it's still not enough to suffice and actually fill our hearts with the love and the kindness that only the Heavenly Father can have a, give us. So Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. Come on, all locations, say rest. rest. Oh, man, you need it. You said it loud. <laughs> rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can you see the connection here? He, he begins to reveal that, that God the Father, He's like an ox, and he's like a house. He shelters. He protects. He's a strong leader. And then Jesus immediately jumps into this other powerful revelation and analogy, showing them, hey, when you come to me, you discover who the Father is, and look at the result. All the yokes that have been weighing you down. If you don't know what a yoke is, it's not just the center of an egg. It's it's something that goes on your shoulders. It was what they put on the ox shoulder to actually plow the field. And so all the disciples would understand this idea. Even Paul understood that the yoke of the law was too heavy for any human being to actually fulfill. There is no person that's ever carried the yoke of this world or the yoke of the law and actually been fruitful in it. No one except Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is not just the one that gives a new yoke. He's also the breaker of old yokes. So when he died on that cross, he broke every yoke that's on your shoulders right now that you think you have to carry in order to have worth. So you're trying to make up for a whole past, a whole history of sin and shame and guilt. And Jesus is wanting to come into your world and lift that yoke. But guess what? The yoke is lifted based on the revelation of the Father. And he says, the father, he is the strong ox. See, this is what they would do with younger ox. I'll be the little ox, okay? I know it's easy to imagine right now. <laughs> that They would bring the, the little ox, and they wouldn't place another little ox next to it to plow the field. They would place that little ox under the strong ox, and train the younger ox to plow the field, and the yoke 
was not even on the shoulders of that little ox. And the strong ox carried all the weight. And that little ox was getting so pumped. Man, this is so easy. I can't believe it. I watched that, the, that my, my dad ox, he would plow the fields and man, it looks so hard, but man, look at how good I am. I'm telling you, when you come under the revelation of the Father, when you come under the revelation of His grace, when you come under the revelation of His patience, when you come under the revelation of His compassion, come on, somebody, when you come under the revelation of His love, come on, something begins to shift. You realize that you can be fruitful in life. Some of you are stuck with all your effort, and you're never going to move forward. There's never going to be any forward momentum. Did you know that the third letter in the Hebrew, Gimel, is a sign of a foot or a shoe, it speaks of movement. When you come under the revelation of the Father and the Son, you get the Holy Spirit, and that's when you begin to progress in life. That's when you begin to actually take ground for the kingdom, when you begin to take ground on your visions and your dreams, when the Holy Spirit who energizes you, you're no longer weary trying to prove yourself because you've already been proven by Calvary. You already know your wealth because Jesus spilt his blood over 2,000 years ago. You know you're worth it. Why? Because he's made a way. And so come under that yoke. And what does it do? You begin to learn. The, this big ox is not all over the field. I mean, this is a straight line. He, he knows how to plow a field. He knows how to make this life worthwhile. I don't know about you, but you, my, my decisions without his leading are all over the place. I'm just like, yeah, let's go for a walk. Yeah, this, maybe over here I'll be satisfied. May, maybe over here, the broadcast team are hating me right now. And, and I, I mean, I, over here, maybe I'll find meaning like... I'm sorry, Williamsburg and Queens and downtown Brooklyn. Can you see me? Okay. But this, we end up in all sorts of weird places thinking that we have the intellect, we have the wisdom, and, and, and I, I can carry the yoke. That's why it says don't be unequally yoked in terms of relationship. Oh, I know best. I'll, I'll make it all happen. I, I know how to figure out dating and everything else apart from God. And then we get to the altar and we go, hey, God, welcome to my marriage. No, no, come under the revelation before, while you're single. Welcome him into your world. Find your worth before, before you get yoked to someone else. So this is all here to help us. Jesus is not praying an exclusive prayer to say, you, you don't have this revelation. He's saying, come to me. And so out of this, I want to give us four takeaways. The Father is revealed through Jesus. If you're still not sure what I'm saying, I'm saying, look to Jesus. He is the visible image of an invisible God. He knows the Father, and His imprint is on Him. So if you're wondering if God loves you, look to Jesus. If you're wondering if He's patient, look to Jesus. If you're wondering if He still heals, look to Jesus. If you're wondering if your Father is for you, look to Jesus. All that the Father is, is revealed through Jesus. Anything that Jesus is not, you can say the Father is also not. And so don't add to the revelation just look to Jesus. There's all sorts of interesting religious people out there that will try to say God is like something, but I, I don't listen until I look back to Jesus. And if Jesus is not that, then the Father is definitely not that. And so we see that the revelation of who Ava Father is, is seen in Jesus. Number two, knowing the Father. See, when you know the Father, it lifts burdens and gives us new strength. When I, when I knew my, my, heaven, my earthly father, I should say, was in the house, the atmosphere shifted. I remember taking out my, one of my first chewers was uh, doing the garbage run out to the back shed. I grew up in Long Island those, those years, and it was dark some nights, especially in winter. And, and, and the first few times when I was younger, he started me at about three years old taking the garbage out. And, um, and so... He, he would help me take the garbage out and say, it's okay, you don't have to be afraid of the dark. And I was actually 17, but anyway. <laughs> but then he would let me do it on my own, and I missed his presence. And one day I walked out, and there was a raccoon in the shed that had rabies, and it went up on its hind legs, began to foam at the mouth like I preach, and it, and it, would, and it tried, tried to scare me, and I ran. I threw the garbage at it. 
and I ran back in the house. I wanted my father's protection. But the reality is, is that the father lifts things. It lifts and creates protection over your life. You know, when you're out there in the workplace and you're not sure, do I make the integrous decision or do I cut the corner? Do I, do I, am I intimidated by this interview or am I intimidated, intimidated by this boss or do I stand firm knowing I know who I am? Don't be manipulated by this world. Don't think that you have to lower your standards, lower your holiness for someone else. Why? Because the Father's got you. He protects you. He keeps you. The Father knows what we struggle with, but still meets us where we're at. This is a big one. Because if we're honest, we've learned to hide our burdens. But Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdensome. Maybe that's the first sign of humility is acknowledging that I'm struggling is acknowledging that I do have a yoke on my shoulder that's weighing me down. Well, I love it because the Heavenly Father doesn't get shocked when He sees our struggles. He knows you. He's known you your whole life. He knows what you're struggling with right now, and He's present to help, church. He's present in your time of need. And He's seen in Jesus a high priest that empathizes with our suffering, that empathizes with our struggles. And Jesus says, come, just come. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to change how you look. You don't have to change how you dress. You don't have to change your burdens and your struggles and and have nice Christian terminology. You can just say, hey, I'm struggling. I'm burdened. And today God can lift that in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, give God some praise today. The last thing is the Father does the heavy lifting. He is the bigger ox. All we need to do is surrender. Come under a new yoke today. The sign that we need to respond today. The sign that all of us can respond at Queens and downtown Brooklyn, Manhattan, here and and at Williamsburg. I'm telling you, all locations today, you can respond. Every individual here. See, I, I cannot decide this for you. You have to say, Aleph. Bet the ox and the house, I want to welcome in the Holy Spirit into this dwelling place. But all of it starts with a new revelation of who the Father is. That He's a, a leader. That He's one that covers us. And He's one that dies for us. He's one that raises us up. He's a Father that cares. And He's a Father that's not just present like a floating blob in the room, he's actually living on the inside of us and he loves us so much. So would we bow our heads and close our eyes today? And I want to give you that opportunity. Just like Jesus said, I want you to lift your hand as a sign. I want to come. I want to receive this rest. I want to come under this new yoke. Just like that baby ox, the yoke will be on his shoulders, not on mine, not on yours. And the sign that we need to respond today across all locations is simply this. Are you burdened? Are you struggling? Is there weariness? Even if you're a believer, I'd love you to respond. But especially if you've never said yes to Jesus, this is your day. See, Jesus on that cross took the weight, took the burden of sin. It was a weight, the scripture says. It was a weight so heavy that no human being could take it except God himself putting on human flesh so that no longer we would be destroyed by sin, but rather we'd be raised to new life by the power of this cross, by the power of this sacrifice. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed right now, if there's anyone here that can, like Jesus said, humble themselves, Let go of what you think God is or what he's about and rather come under the revelation that Jesus has for us, that he's a loving, compassionate, kind father, patient and long-suffering. Just like the father in the prodigal son story, he's a father that runs out to us. He's not a father with arms crossed, wondering if we're going to get it all together. No, he runs out to us and embraces us today. So if that's you today and you know you need to respond, you need in your heart of hearts, you need to say yes to him or come back to him. Or maybe you used to be under this 
amazing revelation of the Father, but if you're honest, you put on other yokes. Maybe other people have put them on you, and you're feeling weighed down and burdened. My friend, today's a day to break those yokes by the power of Jesus Christ, to break every slavery, every earning of approval, every spirit that says that you are worthless. Those, those yokes can be broken in Jesus' name. Today is your day. This is your day. So on the count of three, I want every, every heart to consider this, every hand to be lifted if you know you need to break this yoke and come under the revelation of his love, to say yes to Jesus Christ. One, two, if this is you today, without hesitation, lift your hand. Three, right now, if that's you, across this place. Awesome, awesome, fantastic. Come under this amazing yoke today, amazing. His love is for you, so good. Who else is there today? Just lift your hand up. Jesus outstretched both hands as a sign of love and surrender on that cross. The least we can do is humble ourselves and lift our hands and say, you know what? It's right. I've got weariness. I've got burdens. I want to know who I am in the Father's love. I want to know who the Father is through Jesus Christ. Just lift your hand and say, Josh, that's me today. Pray for me today across all locations. Pray for me today that I would have a revelation of who he is. Just between you and God, I'll just wait one more moment. Many hands going up here at Manhattan. Who else is there saying yes? Remember, it's worth it for one, but each one counts. If it's many ones, that's many houses coming back. God came back to reclaim your house, to reclaim your life. The enemy wants to make his home in you. The enemy wants to steal the life in your house, in your body, in your soul, in your spirit. But come on, give authority back to the head of the house, the Father. Give authority back to your life and your mind to the one that made you, the one that loves you, the one that died for you, the one that rose again. If that's you right now, come on, say yes. Humble yourself and come back in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can look this way. Can we give all those people a big hand across... All locations, come on. The Bible says when just one comes to the Lord, all of heaven celebrates in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Come on. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to pray together. I want us to repeat this prayer across all locations right now. And I want you to say it from your heart. Even if you prayed this prayer before, even if you said yes to Jesus before, because even if you know Jesus, it's so easy to come under another yoke, to come under a, an old revelation of the Father, and things can just build up. So right now, let's say these words. Close your eyes. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, say, Abba, I come to you now. I humble myself, and I want to say sorry. Today, I receive your yoke. Lift every burden every heavy weight. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to break every yoke, to fulfill the law, to die the death, and to rise again. Today, I am forgiven. I am set free. I am washed clean. I am a child of God. No longer an orphan. I am a son or a daughter. In Jesus' name, I receive it. Take away this orphan spirit. I know who I am because I know who the Father is. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise.